Hey, Grace. How's it going? Thanks for joining us for the live Q&A. Um, if you guys can all hear me, uh, we're just going to give it a couple minutes for a few more people to join. But we already got some, some questions coming in. So um, if you can see uh, your chat button on the left, here we go. A couple more people. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're missing Spencer and Alberto, so I'll give them one more minute, but um, hopefully everybody enjoyed the panel. I thought it was a great discussion. Um, you can see uh, one of the first questions is talking about steel slabs. Steel slabs. Hey, Spencer. Hey, Spencer. Hello. I don't know if you can I hear it. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe try, uh, maybe try muting, yourself. muting yourself. Muting yourself. Okay, that might have helped. Did that help? I don't hear the echo anymore, yay. <laughs> okay, um, so just to get a question, um, I don't see Alberto from Yelmi here yet, but um, we can just get it moving. Uh, so um, from Redek, one of the questions, if you see in the chat box on the left side of your screen was, is there a plan to start Steel Slabs contracts? There we go, we got Alberto. Hi. Hello. Um, so, so yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, one of the first questions that we got is about the potential for a steel slabs contract. Um, so I would kick this over to one of the two exchanges first. Ian, you've been here for a minute already, so I don't know if you want to go first on that one, but has CME ever considered a slab contract? Sure. Um, can you hear me all right, Grace? Yes. Good, good. Um, so we, um, as an exchange, actively look at contracts to and um, and different um, assessments to ensure we're serving the market appropriately. So we certainly looked at the slab contract. We haven't had the um, kind of market support to launch one yet, but that is certainly something we could look more into um, if, if if the market supports it. I mean that that's an engagement we do kind of on an ongoing basis to ensure that we have all the products in place um, to meet market needs. Mm -hmm. And Alberto, uh, that question was really actually directed at the LME specifically, so. Well, we looked at SLAB in the past, but we didn't find uh, the market to be large enough to support a contract and be able to build the needed liquidity. So that was the first feedback we got. And uh, we think the correlation is quite high with some of the finished products or with inputs like Scrap anyways. Uh, for the same reason that we don't have a bill contract because it would cannibalize rebar and scrap partially. We think at the moment the situation with love is similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it would be difficult to do um, just with the amount of production there is domestically. Um, a lot obviously comes in via import. So uh, yeah. probably not a liquidity on either side. For most people's circumstances, uh, and probably not for all, but for most, the you know in, any of the HRC contracts or, or finished contracts um, are going to be are going to be a good hedge for it. So I mean, if you're importing into the U.S., um, you know you're really you're fixing your price when you buy the slab, assuming you buy it at a fixed price. And really, what you need to hedge then is what your sale is. And if you're buying a slab, it's generally going to be linked to an index. So then you use that. <laughs> You use the uh, you use the finished goods and 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 you can probably get to where you need to get through. And if you've got specific circumstances that that call for something, I mean, get in touch with myself, get in touch with Spencer, get in touch with you know any of the other people in the markets, and and I'm sure um, you know your banks, and you know we'd all be happy to kind of walk you through it. Thanks, Drew. Um, 
I think uh, that one's covered. So um, another question that we got is, um, does anybody think there's potential for a derivative from scrap to finished product, for example, or that is bushling to HRC? Um, I thought this was possible to do anyway, but somebody can uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's possible right now. Um, so th there's multiple ways you can do it. Um, you can um, execute it on screen. We actually have it um, implied, this, this spread, where you could um, get both legs of that HRC and bushling scrap to capture that spread. Or as we mentioned during the round table, you can do a, a block trade and clear um, basis CME, um, the differential between those two contracts. So that's already in place, and I can certainly follow up with more detail on, on how that um, how you could execute from from scrap to a finished product there. And um, I don't know if anybody else has a thought here, but just, is it possible if even if uh, there is not a listed contract um, to do something like that in OTC? Like if it, you know, if you wanted to hedge maybe a different raw material versus HRC or something like that, is that also possible? Yeah, you can you can create anything you want OTC. So if somebody wanted to do U.S. or, you know, let's say Turkish scrap versus U.S. HRC, if somebody wanted to do, you know, even if it was across exchanges, um, you can create any any product that you want. And and with the with the the variety of clear derivatives that exist out there, you would almost certainly be able to clear it. Mm -hmm. Right. Obviously, some people take advantage of arbit arbitrage opportunities, too. Right. So. OK, thanks. Um, all right, we got some other questions coming in now. And uh, if you're watching, feel free to keep keep adding some more. Um, so from David Good, um, getting a position is key. It's not just inventory. What's the best tool or system to get the physical and financial tools to build positions and PL? Uh, do most people just do spreadsheets? Yeah, I, I think I can take that one. This is Ganesh. So uh, I think it's a great question, right? So uh, I think we kind of covered them in the webinar where we talked about uh, looking at the risk holistically. So there is definitely a lot of movement uh, of people moving from spreadsheets, uh, but uh, the iron ore, especially that side of the Ferris markets, is actually uh, maturing so far. Uh, we do see three kind of systems where people want to actually uh, buy or implement. Number one, is are you able to actually handle the complex pricing formulas if you have a physical site? Number two, are you able to actually link their financial physicals and their FX deals to give them a holistic risk management? Number three, uh, are you able to actually bring in a dynamic inventory valuations within your trading platform rather than relying on ERP? And number four, from a technological angle, people are looking at um, uh, how efficient is your data model from a platform perspective so that I can actually make some meaningful insights try to convert the actual position data pnl data rather than looking at like from a data perspective i can actually derive the data into meaningful insights so if you have a platform such like that which exists and uh, it does and then it is better to actually look at uh, your um, procurement of a system like that from from these three dimensions and also of course uh, you know uh, when you when you start looking at a project of that scale you need to quickly understand the system capabilities and the time to implement Hope that answers, Booty. Yeah, I would, I would add one one thing that people to show in mind too is, is a lot of times, um, and we, we have a technology solution. I'm not going to uh, go into the sales pitch for it, but you want to make sure that you've either got the resources in house, or you're bringing in the resources from outside to help you make sure that that technology is really driven across the organization. Because I've seen, and I'm sure Ganesh has as well, where somebody will bring in a, a system that can be really, really good, but if they don't have the in house expertise, they wind up using 5% of it, or or at times I've seen it happen where they even, they do a multi-million dollar implementation, which these things can cost a lot. Um, they don't have to, but they can. And then they don't know how to use it because, they, and they wind up doing most of their stuff on Excel, and then at the end of the day, plugging it back into the system. Um, and I'm actually thinking of, of you know, the, the ERP that we use when I was at RBC. We actually have a desk level track <laughs> The, the the ERP system was, was difficult to use, so it, we use it almost more as a, as a check. Um, but you want something that's that's user friendly that you're able to, to make it work. But but you can't you cannot track this stuff in Excel and do a good job of it. You can't get the risk analytics around it. You need you need some kind of system, and, there, and there's a broader array you know a broader array out there. Um, Agree. 
You got the echo got back. The echo back. <laughs> um, Spencer, um, Spencer, I, don't, I, don't, I think it I think might, it be, might yours. be yours. Let's yeah, I'm, I'm also not really here. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, from Damian Brennan, um, he said, we have a small rolling mill service center and will not staff up an internal team for hedging. What combination of services would we need to have um, for outside company design to execute and monitor the trades? Um, he says that he's not interested in working with multiple vendors. I've seen this question come up a lot. Like, you know, um, some people have a role on their financial team for risk management, even when it is internal. So maybe just talking about um, how to staff internally or externally, you know, what's the approach for that? So I'll, I'll, I'm going to jump in again. If I apologize, I'll, I'll be quiet. But this, this is one of our major, one of our major business lines at Mobius is actually, um, you know, for everyone from from very, you know from very small producers or service centers all the way up through you know multi multi billion dollar uh, public companies, we basically act as the outsourced. Uh, we call it a trading desk. When we say trading, we're not talking about speculation. We're talking about that marketability, the ability to execute, the ability to manage the risk, the ability to break down the position. But you need you need your front office. So the way a, a bank would be set up or a merchant would be set up, um, you're gonna have your front office traders um, who by and large aren't, aren't taking risk positions, they're managing risk positions, which, which everyone has, including a, a small rolling mill. And then you're gonna have your middle office, which is gonna break down your risk, tell you what what this looks like from, a, from an implied leverage perspective, from a stress testing perspective, et cetera. And then you have everything on the back end as far as the accounting, the invoicing, the reconciliation, um, you know, and, and, and everything along those lines. So we do all of that. There's other companies out there as well. Um, you know, some of which have worked in the past who, who do, you know, various aspects, you know, either portions of that or all of that. But I would say find, find a few people that, you know, have a name in the industry um, and talk to them and see who you're comfortable with, see who you like, see what's going to be the best solution for, you know, for your needs. But it's certainly, uh, it's certainly a very, a very doable thing. Um, you know, there's, there's us and, and other companies out there that are reputable that, that would be happy to help you with it. Anybody else want to uh, weigh in? Um, sure. I'll just uh, reinforce um, your sentiment um, that we do continue to see this as a common trend and, and Drew fits in really nicely a, a, as a kind of, um, advisory role to help growth in, in this market and, and really facilitate um, that, that holistic solution um, for a firm looking to get involved in derivatives but doesn't have the resources to staff someone full time. You can just plug and play there. So that, that's that been a common, common thing we've seen across the industry and, and you wouldn't be a, alone in, in looking for that service. So um, that, d definitely see that as a common theme here in steel. And Grace, I would just briefly add, you know, looking at this from a financing perspective, it's it's our experience that companies that make these investments early and, and often really do well. So whether we're talking about software and the integration of your position and your accounting system, or we're talking about just executing a, a fully integrated risk management and hedging strategy, uh, whether that's internal or external, it's really worth getting it right and spending the money at the beginning. Not to say you need your own in-house team, but having um, having a team that knows what they're doing will make your life easier down the road because your bank, your capital providers are going to want to see reports. They're going to want to make sure they're accurate. They're going to want to make sure they tie to your financial statements. Um, and it's it's worth putting in the upfront investment to uh, to make sure you avoid uh, painful uh, speed bumps down the road. Yeah, and I just add it's not it's not just for smaller companies that don't have anybody in house. Uh, you think about how how people view their legal teams. You have a general counsel, you have a legal staff, but nobody's going to staff up with a team of international tax experts and a team of transfer pricing people and a team of litigators and a team and a team and a team, which is really what you need. So. I think companies have found in, you know, whether you're talking about legal, or you're talking about other and risk management is so different that even if you have a team in house, it's going to be, you know, one, two, three people who are the generalists who lead that business line. 
But every so often, not full time, but you're going to need a specialist who really knows the Midwest gas markets or really knows the global scrap markets or really knows this market or this market. And it's just not going to be economical to bring somebody on who's not going to be a cheap hire full time to do that for the 2 percent of the year that you need it. So that's where you you outsource that to, you know, to us or to others uh, who have that expertise, who can kind of be that extension of your organization as needed. And if I can echo a position that uh, Drew made during his uh, presentation earlier, it's not just derivatives that create a risk position. Running a business generates risk positions. So the investment into how you track your risk, how you manage your exposure, how you identify and calculate your exposure should probably be made regardless of whether you decide to manage it with derivatives or not. Because you could simply manage it by speaking with your suppliers and customers and trying, for example, to fix the price of your supplies. But the system for tracking, measuring, and evaluating this risk is probably be put in place to be able to take full control of them. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at your if you look at your position and you don't know to the dollar how much you're going to make or lose if HRC is up ten dollars next month, um, and it's not your inventory, it's how your inventory prices, it's how your sales contracts and purchasing contracts price. If you don't know the dollar what that's going to do, then you need to do, you need to make those investments. And if you do know that, but you don't know what the odds are that that's going to happen, you don't know what the odds, what the corresponding scrap position is going to do, what the corresponding iron or coal position might do statistically, then you're playing with imperfect information. You also need to make that investment. And that's, you don't have to, but it's the equivalent of a, of a football coach 25 years ago that didn't know that if you're on the on the 30 down by 10, you should probably go for it on fourth and one. And at this point, people know that. And it doesn't mean you don't overrule those statistics sometimes because there's there's a, a judgment call component to it. But you want to have that information in front of you in order to help guide those decisions. That's where decision science comes in. And that's where, you know, again, the software comes in, whether it's it's us or it's somebody else. And that's also where the expertise comes in. Again, whether it's us or somebody else, you should you should be talking to people and, and, and seeing what's out there. Spencer, do you want to try to weigh in? I'm sorry, you didn't get a chance to earlier. Oh, we can't hear. OK. Sorry, we can't hear you, Spencer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I will just uh, say, I guess the the easiest step is to reach out to somebody that's on this call and just um, chat with them. And it, it, as we discussed, you know, during the recording, uh, it's becoming increasingly a competitive advantage to be able to use risk management. Um, we actually have reached our allotted time for the live Q&A. It flew by, but um, thanks everybody so much for joining. Uh, that concludes our first day for our virtual steel success strategies. Um, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. The opening keynote will be POSCO. Uh, and please check out our two tech panels in the afternoon. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, guys. Cheers.